Uh, we're now recording, so let me re repeat. Uh, this is Z167395, the Elm Thicket at North Park authorized hearing. It's a Q&A session. Uh, we're going to involve the steering committee. Uh, and if the steering committee wants to uh, work on some of the questions from the audience or uh, allow them to speak, we'll go with it. We're just going to work with what we, the time we have available. So some quick housekeeping uh, for accessibility. In the lower left-hand corner of your screen, there's a little robot thing icon. Uh, you can do any, there's 99 languages you can choose. Um, and to get closed captioning in English or Spanish or whatever you're happy with. Um, uh, you just click the captions icon in the corner, select the language and display the captions. So, uh, more housekeeping, let's talk, uh, let's talk some courtesy items here. The mute uh, button uh, at the bottom of your screen, it should be at the bottom. Um, yeah, please mute yourself when you're not speaking. Uh, the chat feature is available for questions and comments. Uh, you can utilize the raise your hand feature in your reactions menu. All of those are down there at the bottom if you're on your desktop. Um, I think if you need to mute and unmute yourself, I think that's start or pound six if you're using uh, WebEx over the phone. Uh, we will definitely say uh, public comment is appreciated. Please address your questions and comments in the chat to everyone. Uh, let's keep it very civil. Um, this this is going to be recorded for posterity, so uh, we don't want anybody accusing anybody of saying ugly things. Uh, the internet is forever. So um, this presentation overview is a real quick background in history, purpose, uh, comparison of steering committee and staff recommendations, discussion and next steps. It is a lot of the same slides you saw on January 6th. Uh, I apologize for that, but it, the reason we're having this meeting is so we can discuss those uh, recommendations and, and proposals by staff. Uh, so there's a quick history of the strategic neighborhood action plan. Uh, when it was finalized, um, an action step in the plan was uh, we need to do a zoning change in order to aid in neighborhood stabilization. Uh, the authorized hearing uh, was in, initiated September 2017. Uh, first community meeting was a few years later in 2020. Uh, during that meeting, a steering committee was asked to, to form. Uh, people volunteered for that steering committee. Uh, the steering committee was then appointed by uh, Mayor Pro Tem Medrano. Um, there's 11 members of the steering committee. Uh, they do not have to be geographically located all inside the authorized hearing area. Uh, they're chosen based on um, expertise, uh, the, the desire to be involved, uh, and uh, they're supposed to be looking out for the best interest of the neighborhood. It's kind of a representative group that's looking out for the neighborhood and drafting these recommendations. Uh, there's 12 steering committee meetings that have been held so far from January 11th of 2021 to January 6th of 2022. Uh, the second community meeting was held as a hybrid in-person and WebEx meeting on August 21st, 2021. Uh, this is actually what we're required to do. Uh, this, is, this is the uh, signed authorized hearing request. It's, Consideration of an authorized public hearing to determine the proper zoning, and then it gives a whole lot of information about the location. Um, and then consideration is to be given to appropriate zoning for the area, including use development standards and other appropriate regulations. This is a hearing to consider the request to authorize the hearing and not a rezoning of the property at this time. So what that means is the steering committee just gives recommendations to city plan commission the city plan commission uh actually authorizes the re rezoning of the property then it hands the recommendations off to city council and they approve the rezoning so there's a lot of steps involved we're not there yet <laughs> uh, a little some more background in history this was the uh proposed changes map that the steering committee uh proposed and you can see PE67 
uh, is over here. It has four sub districts. Uh, sub district one is up here at the top uh, Hopkins, March, Cohen Avenue, and, and bordered at the south by University. Uh, and then PD two and four is the apartment complex on University and Roper. Uh, and then PD three is the area south of Linnet. Uh, and north of Mockingbird and west of Roper. So that's PD 67 tract three. Uh, so the meeting purpose, so it, uh, it, the staff evaluated community input. Uh, we found a, dis back on uh, August 21st, 2021, uh, we found a disparity in the understanding of the process, the goals of the authorized hearing, a lot of misunderstanding of what the steering committee uh, was doing uh, and their impact. Uh, so we kind of that's that's what we call the the point where we put the brakes on things. Uh, staff further studied the area and input and produced a set of recommendations based on, based on best practices, community input, and steering committee recommendations. Uh, we're going to continue to assess input and prepare additional options as needed. Uh, that's what this meeting is for. So. Uh, we're continuing to assess. So, how did the staff come up with our recommendations? It was addressed in the previous slide a little bit, but here's our comprehensive plans that we have to go by. We have uh, citywide and area plans. So, there's the Fort Dallas uh, comprehensive plan. There's the Elm Thicket North Park neighborhood action plan. Uh, we even have the ordinance that is the 2019 Dallas Equity Indicators Report. Uh, with, with action items for us to attempt to achieve uh, as city staff. Um, uh, we have regular best practices uh, known through the planning community. We have to address the steering committee recommendations. Uh, any other department recommendations, whether that's fire, police, parks department, uh, the city arborist, the uh, uh, transportation de department, they're all involved. They all want to have a little bit of input or, or none at all. It just depends on uh, what they see in the neighborhood. And if they uh, sense a need for more street lighting, like if the police says we need more street lighting, they'll make that recommendation. We can include that in our zoning requirements uh, or our zoning requirement recommendations. Uh, there's bond projects we have to pay attention to. Uh, you can see that map there where, we can, where uh, current projects are going on within the neighborhood. Uh, that's important for us to keep track of uh, because bond projects, uh, the infrastructure projects uh, affect the zoning and affect how the land is going to be used in the future. Uh, and then lessons learned. You know, we, we've got other uh, authorized hearings in the city, other code amendments in the city. So that's where lessons learned comes in. Um, yeah, these slides are going to be available after the meeting and I'll, I will, uh, send a link to the PDF or yeah, a PDF of this, this slideshow, uh, to, uh, everybody that attends. Hopefully maybe even just everybody I invited. So we catch everybody, uh, staff proposed changes for PD 67. This was kind of my, my easy win that I thought I could get. Um, uh, PD 67 is built upon obsolete code language. There's a chapter 51 zoning ordinance and a chapter 51 a zoning ordinance. Um, and chapter 51 was what was originally the zoning ordinance for the city of Dallas. 51 a is the new. Uh, zoning code for the city of Dallas, and it's, it's not very new. It's, it's over 30 years old. Or at least 20 years old. Um, uh, track two and four, they have different requirements. Uh, uh, track four references, uh, chapter 51, a, the new zoning code, and we're talking different definitions, different interpretations of how things go. Uh, the, um, yeah, that's the difference between 51 and 51 a is, uh, different definitions, different, uh, interpretations. Uh, different ways to take measurements, all of those kind of things are, 
come into play with 51 and 51A. So uh, our proposal is combine track two and four uh, into one, uh, one tract so that it conforms with 51A instead of 51. Um, and whoever develops in the future on that land uh, or even makes any changes to, to the land in the future, they can uh, do it a lot easier. You don't have to hire a consultant to, to interpret the code for you. Um, the steering committee proposed changes for track three PD 67 uh, was to allow duplex use uh, permitted on property fronting Roper and Mabel Avenue. 90% um, of the roof of the main structure must be hip and gable when greater than 20 feet from grade. Um, maximum structure height is 25 feet. No portion of the structure can be greater than 30 feet from grade. Maximum lot coverage is 45% for single story structures and 35% for multiple story structures. The maximum lot coverage for of 45% is the existing R75A zoning requirement for the neighborhood. So there's no, no change for single story. It's mainly addressing multiple story structures. Um, one of the things I pointed to was the hip and gable roof and to, to get an understanding of what hip and gable means. Um, there's some, uh, a slide I've used in a previous, uh, presentation, give you an idea of what a hip and gable roof. And when we talk peaked roofs, uh, that's what it means. Uh, you can see kind of see the a gable roof on this end and the hip roof here, uh, in the illustration. The track. Uh, staff proposed changes to uh, was to for PD67 was also to include track one into uh, with the same requirements for track three, um, and that was just a a equity issue. There was very little that we could see property wise different between track one and three, and we want to have some consistency. Uh, the neighborhood. PD67 is split by the apartment complex. That's track uh, two and four, but beyond that, track one and two are very similar. Um, the additional staff proposed changes for track one and three was to set a maximum structure height of non-residential structures to 15 feet, and no no portion of the structure can be greater than 20 feet from grade, and a maximum lot coverage of 45% for single structures. Uh, and 35% for multiple story structures echoes what the steering committee recommended, but we added in the maximum lot coverage for non residential structures is 20%. We wanted to keep um, sheds and detached garages, uh, those non residential structures, those accessory structures from taking up too much of the lot and still allowing some lawn and uh, some room. So the steering committee proposed changes. Uh, the current roof type is not regulated. And then, so what's proposed is 90%. Uh, we talked about that in a previous slide. Staff proposed change is just to include track one into that requirement. The maximum structure height is 30 feet. Uh, currently, uh, steering committee wants to bring it down to 25 feet. Um, our only comment on this is non-residential structures, those accessory structures were not addressed. Uh, we want to we want to uh, limit the height of those non-residential structures. Uh, and then jump into the next slide. Uh, staff or steering committee proposed changes for a new PD, and this is in the R75 area uh, east of Roper uh, and west of Oriole. Basically, there's a little bit that extends uh, down Watika and University. It's and just that small more west. This one now they're talking about this new PD making this a new one. Yeah. This light blue, which is where Lawrence House is. Hang on one second. You're, please mute it's yourself if you're. Uh... Thank you. Um, so the new PD. Uses a little bit of the uh, language from the 
PD67. It's just 90% of the roof of the main structure must be hip and gable when greater than 20 feet from grade. Um, maximum structure height is 25 feet. No portion of the structure can be greater than 30 feet from grade. Uh, maximum lot coverage is 45% for single story structures and 35% for multiple story structures. So, uh, very, very similar to uh, what's there. The staff concurs with the steering committee proposed changes from the area that they propose, but actually prefers to uh, include the entire highlighted area. Um, I had a better slide, I swear. I, I, yeah, um, I've got a better map than this that includes everything that's zoned R75A uh, was highlighted in blue. Um, this is not the map that I had, so I apparently missed that edit. Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, new curb cuts should be a maximum of 15 feet wide. Um, after talking with the neighborhood over the last few days, last week, I'm very willing to compromise on that. Um, and front entry doors must be parallel and visible from the street with no side entryways. Um, where staff is also willing to negotiate on that as far as the front entrance must be parallel and visible from the street. So if you have a porch that's facing the street, uh, that's we're amenable to that compromise. So here's a steering committee proposed map again with all the types of housing in that area. The staff proposed map. Oh, there it is. There's my, there's my map that actually has everything highlighted in blue. Um, that's that's the staff proposed changes map showing all of the R75 area highlighted in blue, uh, and then the purple area highlighted for PD for track one and track three of PD67. Additional staff recommendations. We're going to review comments received from this meeting, determine whether any further considerations need to be made uh, prior to CPC review. So that's we're just we're listening. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna try to incorporate what's discussed. Uh, we're gonna cons uh, and then staff also wants to re recommend considering a separate neighborhood stabilization overlay for the area if the additional design requirements are desired are desired for the area or portions of the area. So a neighborhood stabilization overlay is neighborhood driven. It is not staff driven. Um, it has to be initiated by people, property owners, and it has to be a minimum of 10 property owners and or, or the owners of 10 properties is the technical language of it. And it has to have a minimum of 50 residences or 50 homes in that neighborhood stabilization overlay to be considered. So this is a, uh, this is kind of the outline within the Dallas city code of, of how a neighborhood stabilization overlay uh, is handled. Uh, so the city finds that, and this is kind of uh, what the steering committee has found as well. So this is why there's a overlap. Uh, the the PD that's being proposed by the steering committee is a uh, it's basically a neighborhood stabilization overlay uh, that is driven by a PD instead of driven by or driven by an authorized hearing rather than driven by the neighborhood property owners and, and creating this neighborhood stabilization over, overlay. So. The city council finds the construction of new single family structures that are incompatible with existing single family structures within certain established neighborhoods is detrimental to the character, stability, and livability of that neighborhood and the city as a whole. The neighborhood stabilization overlay is intended to preserve single family neighborhoods by imposing neighborhood specific yard, lot, and space regulations that reflect the existing character of the neighborhood. The neighborhood stabilization does not prevent construction of new single family structures or the renovation, remodeling, repair, or expansion of existing single family structures, but rather ensures that new single family structures are compatible with existing single family structures. 
The yard lot space regulations and the neighborhood stabilization overlay are limited to facilitate creation and enforcement of the regulations. Uh, neighborhood stabilization overlay districts are distinguished from historic overlay districts, which preserve historic residential or commercial places and from conservation districts, which conserve a residential or commercial areas, distinctive atmosphere or character per, by protecting or enhancing its significant architectural or cultural attributes. Uh, those, those kind of, that's the other options that people have is conservation districts, historic districts, uh, neighborhood stabilization overlays, uh, all are a means to affect the zoning in the neighborhood. Uh, there's a little bit more about the neighborhood committee um, and how the process has started. So, wanted to talk about non-conforming uses and structures. That was something that came up a lot in our in the community come and go meeting uh, that I had on Wednesday, Thursday, and Monday of this week. Um, Wednesday and Thursday of last week. So. Uh, talking about non-conforming structures, it's it's addressed in two places within the uh, Dallas City Code. Uh, one, and I don't have it listed here because it's it's dealing more with building code questions, and I and I cited it because I'm very familiar with it. Is um, the Dallas existing building code, which is section 58 or chapter 58 of the uh, Dallas City Code, and it deals with how the building official addresses uh, remodels, repairs, rebuilds of uh, structures. Now, when we're talking about zoning and how they're, they address it, uh, non-conforming structures, um, except it's provided in subsection C2, uh, a person may renovate, remodel, repair, rebuild, or enlarge a non-conforming structure if the work does not cause the structure to become more non-conforming as to the yard, lot, and space regulations. So, uh, with that said, if, if you're going, if you live in a house now, and it's greater than what the proposed zoning changes would be the opportunity to renovate, remodel, repair, rebuild, enlarge is still there, but you would have to do it within the yard lot and space regulations. Um, and I, I, and we mentioned fire and tornado and I wanted, I, I thought about this and I was like, I've got to put this in here. The right to rebuild a non-conforming structure ceases if the structure is destroyed by the intentional act of the owner or the owner's agent. You can't burn it down and build what you want or rebuild it. You, you, uh, that one doesn't play, but if, if a fire sweeps through the neighborhood or somebody else sets fire or, or it's an accident and the fire happens, then you can rebuild it uh, as is. Um, if you're remodeling a structure, housing a non-conforming use, you can do it. Um, and you can actually, um, an accessory structure for non-conforming residents, residential use may be constructed, enlarged, or remodeled in accordance with, with the sections without board approval. When we talk about board, that's the board of adjustment. Um, and See, so let's see, person may renovate, remodel, or repair a structure housing a non conforming use if the work does not enlarge the non conforming use. So, that a lot of remodeling and stuff like that, you don't change the footprint of your home. Um, but if you do go bigger, um, there's this section five down below here, and it's uh, uh, the enlargement of a non-conforming use means any enlargement of the physical aspects of a non-conforming use, including any increased height, floor area, number of dwelling units, or the area in which the non-conforming use operates. Um, so you look at part B and it says the board may allow the enlargement of non-conforming use and then three different uh, subsections or beyond that. But then you look at C, and that's where we have to read it. Structures housing a non-conforming single family or duplex use may be enlarged without board approval. And then you have to go back up to the top and it says, as long as you're, uh, it doesn't become non-conforming as to yard, lot, and space regulations. Notice it didn't say anything about roof pitch. 
It's just yard, lot, and space regulations. Uh, so, uh, and it, um, but it does, space regulations does address height. So, just I wanted to clarify that. We had a lot of people discussing that and fearing that they wouldn't be able to rebuild their house. Um, and now we're going to get into the discussion portion and Jennifer just brought it up. Let's, let's do a little roll call here, here. Um, so give me 1 second to pull up my roll call list and I'll be right with you guys. Well, I, I know a few people here. Um, let's see if I can pull this up real quick. All right, so let's find out who's here. Um, if you're on the steering committee, get ready to unmute yourself. Um, so Doug Brower here. Uh, Andrew Renteria here. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. Um, although we're call, call and roll, this is not totally formal. And, did, and Re Andrew did say here, right? That is correct. Okay, uh, Diane Johnson. I'm here. Uh, Elaine Chambers. I'm here as well. Gus Perez. I'm here. Miss Patty Walker. I'm here. Mark Revis. Uh, he's, he emailed me. He said he ha was dealing with a minor emergency, so I'm hoping that everything's okay with him, but. Uh, he's going to try to make the meeting a little bit later. Uh, Danny Rose. Danny Rose. All right. Tally Roberson. Don't see her in the list. Tally Roberson. Okay. Thomas Barrow. He is not available and uh, has basically given his questions and comments to Doug Brower. Um, so, and, and this is a informal meeting and, and not a, a uh, super formal meeting. So we're not going to, uh, if there would be a vote, he would have given his proxy to, to uh, Doug Brower. Uh, Vivek Anand. He's probably at the 7-Eleven working. And dreading this weather, so uh, he's not available. Um, thought I saw somebody pop up, but all right, okay. That that's the roll. So I'm missing one, two, three, four. Um, everybody else is here, but I'm missing four people. Uh, it's pretty good representation of the uh, 11 members of this committee. Uh, at this point, kind of want to open it up to discussion. Uh, let's see if I can pull it up here, and, and I want to jump up as far back as I can uh, with the chat. And then, uh, if there's any members of the steering committee that's got some questions or discussion items, uh, let's talk about it. Mike, can I start if nobody else wants to jump in on uh, the steering committee? Sure. I have a question as well. So. Diane or uh, Elaine, why don't you go ahead? Okay, sure. Thank you. Um, based on some feedback uh, received at our meetings, um, it was interesting. I just want to get clarification from you, Mike, 
to to validate one way or the other so we're all clear um one comment was made that um based upon the recommend current recommendations um the person would be limited to potentially eight foot ceilings can you share the maximum ceiling height um uh, based upon the proposal so for one story and for a two story what would be the maximum ceiling height a person could have um let's, let's go back to look at the slides here um So when we're talking about structure height, um, we're eliminating the maximum structure height of a residential structure to 30 to 25 feet with no portion of the structure going 30 feet. Um, mm -hmm. The reason that's there, if, if it's one story, um, if you did a very low sloping roof, I, I think you could probably do an 18 foot ceiling uh, and get away with it. Um, if it's two story, uh, when we look at it, we measure height of a structure with a peaked roof or a sloped roof. We measure from the middle of the slope. Um, so if you're if you've got a big 45 degree angle roof uh, that's 10 feet tall, uh, according to the city's measurements, it's only five foot tall. Um, if if it's taller than that, you know you, you can do the math. I'm, I'm gonna let y'all figure that out some, but the uh, but if you had a, a structure, your house, and it's sitting 12 inches above grade, so that's where your floor is above grade, um, and you had two 10-foot ceilings, two, two floors with 10-foot ceilings, you're now at 21 feet, um, and with, say, 18 inches, a foot and a half of, of uh interstitial space between your floors, you know, where your, your floor trusses are. Um, you're now at 22 and a half feet tall, and then you have to uh, get your roof under 30 feet. Mm -hmm. uh, so you've got 16 feet of roof height to play with at that point, because you, we're only measuring eight. Um, so and you would still be the the uh, you only have you have nine no, eight and a half feet, Mike. Yeah, eight and a half feet. Sorry. So you've still got some room to play with as far as height. Now, if you wanted to go to twelve foot ceilings, uh, your roof would the pitch of your roof would flatten uh, quite a bit. Uh, it wouldn't be a flat roof, but it would still be a pitched roof. Uh, Probably a 212 slope or less. Um, so on 12 foot ceilings. Um, so you can change it up and go 12 foot on one and 10 foot on the other. Uh, but there's some there's some variability that can be had there. Um, I think that the the goal is to discourage houses from from towering other houses over other houses. Um, it can be done. It's not limiting anybody to eight foot ceilings or anything like that. Um, so that's, that's where we're, that's where that is. Okay. Um, Mike, can I jump in on that one? Go ahead, sir. So you are 22 and a half feet to your attic, your ceiling height, your top floor ceiling height. If you did 10 feet on both floors, so that leaves you. Uh, actually, seven seven point five feet. So if you have a forty, let's just say we're using a fifty foot wide lot, uh, five foot setbacks. So that gives you a forty foot wide uh, footprint from side to side. So mm -hmm. when so the middle midpoint of your of your gable roof, we're using that would be at twenty feet or twenty feet wide. So using okay. a, four, a four twelve pitch, you would you would exceed the that the, eight, the thirty seven. foot maximum, yeah, right. So you, I don't know how you do it. I've done it. I've tried to do it several ways, and uh, and it's pretty difficult. You know, you'd have to do some really creative things in order to make that work. Yeah, I, it it's going to take some creativity. I think that's something that um, needs to be discussed. Uh, the 
the maximum height in R R75 is 30 feet. So the maximum height's not really changing too much, uh, other than the. Uh, well, we put a hard cap on ours in, in our language. Yeah, and it's hard capped at 30 versus uh, where R75 is 30 feet, but you're measuring halfway up. So you can actually, the roof can go above that 30 feet uh, in a lot of cases uh, that we see. And that's what it's. So that about. was, if we went back to steering committee 10 and 11, we had this discussion uh, and there wasn't a whole lot of, of grace as far as allowing 10 foot ceilings on both floors. Uh, it was considered that's, that's just not needed, um, even though we pointed out that it, it would be really, really difficult to do. So uh, I think the answer to Elaine's question is that uh, I, I can't speak 100% that it can't be done. But I'm, because you could maybe mess with that interstitial space between the two floors and really, but it'll be, it's be very difficult. Yeah, I understand that it is. Um, it's, it's worthy of this discussion. Definitely. Right. And, and just to be fair, Mark Reeves had pointed out that, uh, you know, as an option to going higher was uh, adding a second floor offset from the first floor so that you would have, uh, you wouldn't be towering. It, it wouldn't look so high from the neighboring house. You could go higher, but you wouldn't go higher at right at the setback height at the setback distance. Right. Right. So, uh, and that I think when you know steering going back around, that's when Elaine actually asked for could we get some architectural input on this, and we we never got we never went there. Yeah, I, I uh, I'm going to talk to. My manager and see if I can get some uh, quick architectural renderings done with that, and uh, and I'll I'll try to I will include that with uh, at least on a website and hopefully with this presentation as a supplement. So uh, I think I can I think it can happen. Okay, Mike, I have a couple more questions, and you can you know answer them as we go forth. Uh, the other one, uh, more feedback that I got, and I just want to make sure it's, you know, what the reality is, right? There was a lot of discussion, I think I asked you when we were outside, about people wanting porches on the front and the back. And there was discussion around, you know, someone said they couldn't have a porch, right, on the back. So just clarify, I know there's a um, consideration around slope, right? How much of a right. slope it is, and what percent of that counts towards that ten percent flat roof, et cetera? Can you just clarify that point? And then my last um, point uh, or question I wanted to ask came from the community is around economic incentives um, that the city is providing developers. Is that true, false, or whatever? If you could expound upon that, be great. Those are my questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so when we talk about porches, um, in some cases. Uh, people are going to struggle with with it, but the way that the steering committee proposed the changes is uh, only 90% of the of the structure of the main structure must be hip and gable uh, when greater than 20 feet from grade. We're not if your porch is less than 20 feet from the the roof of your porch is less than 20 feet from grade. It can be a flat roof. We're only talking about the the uh, roof has to be. If it's above 20 feet above grade, has to have uh, a pitched roof or a hip and gable roof. Uh, if you have a first floor patio or whatever, um, unless you're trying to do a plantation style home with the two story front porch or rear porch uh, with the big columns, it seems like it's very feasible to do that. Uh, your other question was about incentives. Uh, what we've learned in, in this process was during uh, the last presidential administration and, and some previous uh, HUD programs that have gone on, there were there's financial incentives for uh, repairing and upgrading, doing energy efficiency upgrades on homes. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, those are tied to uh, Enterprise zones or opportunity zones, uh, depending on which uh, legislation you're looking at from uh, from Congress, those 
enterprise or opportunity zones were based off of land values, off median land values and for uh, a zip code or a census tract, or it was based off of income for a, for a census zone or, or census tract or a area code. What that did to Elm Thicket and North Park was because it's such a diverse neighborhood and because the value of the land, not the value of the structures, but the value of the land is so high, just given its proximity to downtown and, and just what it's worth being close to the field and everything else. Um, it, it took Elm Thicket and North Park out of those opportunity zones, out of those, those opportunities to get that incentive uh, to do upgrades or to do improvements. Uh, and, and what I've discussed and, and what we think we can do is we can, you know, now it's on our housing department's radar. It's on uh, code enforcement's radar. So we're gonna look for other ways to, uh, to fix up houses that we can in this neighborhood and, and you know if we have to do it on a case by case basis and stop using uh, census tracts and area codes and zip codes um, yeah we're gonna have to do it, it it's a uh, it, it's you it got brought up and I, we realized that there's a disparity that this neighborhood faces because of that and, uh, it's a uh, it's very unfortunate All right. All right. okay thank you Um, Elaine, what? Sorry, I just got. What was your second question? Uh, it was the um, around the porch, you know, our patio. Oh, okay, right. I, so I didn't write it down. Mike, uh, I don't know that your answer to that is perfectly clear in what and how it is written. Um, it would be wise, I would believe, to uh, make sure that that's written so that no. Uh, a building planner uh, would interpret it otherwise so that something on the first floor would be acceptable. You're muted, by the way. Mike, I think you're muted. Sorry. Uh, when the steering committee recommendations uh, uh, get finalized and they go to the st city attorney. Yeah, that is something that's going to have to be very clear um, about uh, roof pitch below 20 feet. So, yeah. Okay. Right. So, and, and Mike, this is Gus. I, I think, yeah, I agree uh, that we do need to make sure it's clear. Like, you know, someone, some folks, I've seen some uh, houses that have a garage uh, that is, you know, below the 20 foot and it's got a flat roof on it. Uh, so, what we're saying is, is that that would be allowed. Uh, under the current wording, and I think it, it, it certainly does need to be clear you know, that we're talking about that is not counted as part of the 10% of the uh, total roof area. Right. Okay. Just making sure we're all clear on that too. Yeah. yeah. And if there are any renderings you can bring on that, that would be great as well. Okay. I will. I will get on that. That's fun for me. I like getting on. Lane, that was a great question, by the way. I I hadn't yeah. even considered that. So. Thanks, Doug. Uh, okay. So, Mike, if, or Lane, are you? Is that your 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 question? Point now, Doug. Okay. Uh, can Mike? Can you go back to the NSO language? Sure. Uh, let me let's slide so, up here. This is this is more just is uh, I don't know I'm I'm not sure if Council Member uh, Moreno is still on here, but. The Maybe NSO is. is written as if you go look at this, the very first sentence, and you read it, you've already read it out loud, uh, yeah. is designed for exactly what our process is doing here. So, for some strange reason, you know, we, we chose to go, uh, or the city or the, uh, a select group, a few of the neighborhood chose to go a different route. Uh, the, but the, the city result here is that if you went through the NSO, you'd have to have at least a 50 percent uh, petition, a sign, you know, petition signed by the entire group affected 
to even get it to CPC. So what we've done is we flipped this on its head. So now we have a, we're, we're requiring for a change to be, to be, have to be opposed. So the, it, this is, this is not an NSO, what the steering committee, it is a, we're taking, we're taking a zoning request as a recommendation, but it's a very weighted recommendation to CPC. So it doesn't, they're not looking to see if there's 50% in support of these changes. They're looking to see how many are opposed to these changes versus what an NSO does. So I just want to be very clear that we circumvented what was is very clear in the development code as to how this process should have taken place. And, and you know, to in regard to the fees that were charged or would be would have been charged, uh, if you had a 75% petition, the number of people that were in support of this, you wouldn't even have to pay the fee. So I heard, I've heard anecdotally from various people that the fee was one of the reasons why this wasn't done. So I just want to make it clear, go on the record that this process was a, it, it, there was an existing well-defined process and we went with a ill-defined, very manipulated, manipulable process to, to achieve the end result. That's just my my opinion, uh, my statement. Right, and, and yeah, I I think I when I was going through there, I, I think I was clear that the NSO is different from an authorized hearing because it's neighborhood driven and not city driven, um, and unfortunately, um, I, an NSO wasn't per, pursued way back in 2017. I. I in a way, wish that it had happened. I think it would uh, been a less divisive process than this, but uh, I really, you know, you got to understand it. They're two different animals and the city plan commission uh, wanted to push this forward and they got the signatures and voted to have this authorized hearing. Um, if you want to, if you want to start an NSO process right now, um, I, I think you know, jump in line, jump in there if you if you want to tackle it. It's a right. uh, so so I have a, a okay so I I'll get off my soapbox there on that one. But the second question I have, and this could be to any member of the steering committee, but I just want to go back, and this again, this is for Ed educational purposes for everybody involved here. And this came up a lot in the community meetings that we, you had over the last several days is what were the original goal? What was this steering committee? What problem was this going to solve? Okay. Um, and I open that up to anybody that wants to answer that, that's, that's in favor of doing this process. I have a, uh... I have that. Uh, second. So let me share this with you here. So what we're going to go back to is the recommendation of the area plan for Elm Thicket. So when the authorized hearing came about, the discussion was about neighborhood stabilization. Um, and this is an interesting document because I wanna make sure y'all can see it and hopefully read it. Um, this is an interesting document because uh, this map at the side is just uh, amazing if I, you wanna compare the two between 20, you know, 2017 uh, when this was finalized versus today. Um, Back then, over 40 homes were built or constructed within the last five years. Um, and, uh, and it references that 
Uh, most of them were teardowns with much larger uh, and the houses, the most of the houses that were torn down were teardown houses um, and they have much larger scale and lot coverage now. So that was five, that was 2017 and there were only 40. I would say that number's probably tripled in the last, since this authorized hearing has started. I bet you there's a, a, about 100 houses on top of that 40 uh, since then. Um, and this, this document says um, the, the residents recognize that their neighborhood is going to change, grow, and diversify over time, uh, given its location and proximity. Uh, with growth and change, however, have come concerns that the scale of change are going to displace traditional residents and make this desirable neighborhood and location less affordable. Um, Research has been presented through the Neighborhood Plus process to help residents understand the physical and economic changes taking place. Um, page four shows a map of property value increases throughout the neighborhood. The graphic below shows the scale of the historic housing compared to the new construction replacing them. Um, so when we talk about what was the goal or what is the goal uh, the idea is, is stabilization, uh, getting an idea here of what historic housing looks like, you know, with 30% lot coverage and, and now the new constructed housing is pushing that boundary on an average lot size up to 40, you know, to, to the maximum of 45%. Um, if I go back here, you can see the neighborhood action plan has multiple goals. Uh, that are handled by different departments within the city. Uh, as you can see, there's code compliance, um, different groups that handle this, um, home repair, that's housing and uh, community services, Habitat for Humanity, they, those all contribute. Um, somebody told me that there was a, a group off of, uh, uh, from nearby, uh, an LGBT, uh, charity group that would help seniors with their with upkeep of their homes uh, that was happening prior to COVID. Uh, those are the kind of goals that we have for this neighborhood and, you know, the recommendations. Uh, you know, when you talk about crime, public safety, infrastructure. And so we get down to neighborhood stabilization. I didn't write this and misspell it, so don't blame me. Uh, we did a tax education workshop, and that was something that uh, happened to help people with their taxes. Uh, we need to do it again. Uh, right now, COVID standing in the way of it. Um, we got some nonprofit stuff that can happen, uh, some code compliance things that can happen. But when it comes down here, we have this re this recommendation right here, which is what we are uh, what we're tasked with. So neighborhood PD or zoning change uh, as a long-term change. And we were the sustainable development and construction department. So it fell on us. So that's why it came, that, that's the reason it came about is we were directed by this area planning document to make that happen. So yeah, very long-winded answer. Sorry about that, Doug. Well, uh... Okay, can you put that up that the last page that you just had? Sure. So it doesn't describe the the goal. So, you know, when we're, when I'm listening to the other you know, the folks and I'm, of, you know, what what they expect to have happen after if this all these changes go into effect. And the number one was a reduction in their property taxes. Um, that they're 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 expecting uh, to pay less less taxes. Uh, it's I I don't know. Number two is you know the size of the houses compared to the original homes. Uh, you know where we're talking about an 800 to a thousand square foot. I think that you know, on this thing it may be 800 to 1200 uh, and versus somewhere between, you know, probably like a maximum of 4,200 or 4,300 square foot home. So, you know, we have a, a, a vast size disparity. Um, increasing home ownership, 
Um, I would, I would just go to say, I'm pretty sure that that's already happening. So I don't know that that's going to change. It's just that who are the homeowners, the new homeowners, um, single family rental registration. I would say that our, the number of rentals in this neighborhood is as, as is, has continued to drop to decrease as, uh, more homeowners have built and moved in. Um, I can say that the tax education, uh, at, at a, at a neighborhood. Uh, uh, at Elm, the Elm, the North Park neighborhood, Elm Thicket North Park uh, community meeting we had back in 2018. Um, I was told that, you know, the tax edu education portion of all this is uh, being handled. Not, no, I didn't, you know, I, I offered to, to actually assist with providing information on how to lower your property taxes. And I was told that that's not necessary and that it's being handled. Uh, but our research to date says that that is not that has not happened and that there is a lot of people paying more than what they should in this neighborhood without taking advantage of various exemptions that they should be able to have. So we, we get back down to what exactly are these, you know, this, this goal of defining flat roots uh, or, you know, limiting height. I, I, you know, I get the, the height and the size. You know, in terms of an 800 or 1200 square foot home, but you know, we all know that that's not ever going to, those are, those are never going to be built again. So I, I still, I put the question out there is what is the, the primary goal of these changes? I don't, I, it's not in that list there. So I'll shut up and let somebody else talk. Let's see. And to stop sharing. Well, I'm going to try to leave this up here. And uh, if any other members of the steering committee wants to pipe in. Uh, and see if we have. Trying to make sure somebody didn't drop off here. So I'm sorry about that. Um, I was just making sure everybody was on still in. Uh, what I want to do, I don't think they have to answer. Mike, why can't someone on the steering committee answer this question instead of you? Okay. Um, thank you, Stephanie. Um, if, if somebody on the steering committee wants to answer that, they can, we can also, um, what I want to do is for sure seeing all the questions in this and knowing that there's no way I can answer every single question. Um, we. We are going to create a Q and a document, uh, from this meeting posted on the website. Um, and neighborhood stabilization is the goal. So, uh, when we're talking about. Uh, neighborhood stabilization, it, it's what you can read here and it's, uh. I know it's, it's a nebulous term, but it's. For the people that ask for this, it. it it does include roof pitch it to, to aid in the character. It does include height and lot coverage because they they're lo they feel they're losing what is theirs or, or what was the character of the neighborhood and the and the the charm of the neighborhood. And and so when it comes to neighborhood stabilization, you're trying to preserve those, you know, interpretations of homeowners that have been there for some that have been there, you know, 50 years or more. It, it's a very difficult thing for city staff to try to address. Um, we, we wish, um, we really do wish we could address it better. Uh, we were reaching out and we're studying the, uh, equity indicators toolkit that we have. We're trying to, we're trying to learn from other cities. We're trying to um, do everything we can to help uh, with this term of neighborhood stabilization, but understand we're still um, we're still planning an urban design. We're, we we can only affect the zoning recommendation for this neighborhood, so that's what can be addressed with Chapter 51A of the zoning code, and it can be addressed with uh, a PD and NSO uh, those kind of things. 
I, I wish we could say that we could solve all those problems with one hearing, but it takes the whole city and it takes all the departments to work together to do that. So um, with that, I'm gonna just jump to the next question. Um, I think I had a hand raised by one of the my people. That's why I was searching around a minute ago. I was like, I thought I saw somebody raise a hand. Uh, was it Gus? Perez. Hello, this is Miss Walker. Hey, Miss Walker. Can I say something? Absolutely. This is about the neighborhood stabilization. I wanted to say that um, prior to 2005, there was no such ordinance. Myself and several other people, we worked very hard to get this passed. This we um, ordinance went before the city. Uh, excuse me, before the planning commission. It was on August the 11th, 2005, and the case number on it was DCA 045-009. And if you pull up the minutes, you would see that I spoke before the planning commission then um, have this approved, this zoning issue approved. It later went before the city council, and the date that it went before the city council was September the 28th, then they held it over to October the 26th and it didn't pass until November the 9th. And on November the 9th, it was number 58 on the docket that day. And I think the case number was 26161, but it was 58 on the docket. And the main purpose of it was to stabilize the neighborhoods from the encroachment of development. It was to keep the character, the original character of the neighborhood. So that was the main purpose of it. So does anyone else want to ask any more questions about the stabilization? Uh, that's all I have to say about it. Hey, Mike, this Hello? is Andrew. Oh. Sir? I was gonna ask, uh, can you give me an idea of what is, or how many neighbor, properties are involved in this whole entire neighborhood? There's roughly 1500 properties involved in this zoning uh, authorized hearing. Okay, so if we attacked it as far as doing the NSO and maybe dividing into different areas, you know, to preserve, because I'm in PD 67, but the houses in my area look a little bit different than what's in the R75 and what's up north of university, things like that. There's different characters in this neighborhood. We should be able to get past the threshold to approve an SO, but we have to start that process. Am I, am I correct on the thinking or? You're correct. You just have to start that process. But wouldn't this process hinder starting an NSO or make it harder to? You know, they, there's nothing. Off. There's nothing to stop it from running simultaneously. Okay, thank you. It's Mike. Uh, is it all right if, uh, with the steering committee, uh, Mr. Glover would like an opportunity to speak? If, uh, just kind of want to hands raised. If can can none members speak? That's what I was going to ask. Yeah, I, I want to kind of clarify that. Ms. Chambers says yes. Mr. Brower. Uh, sure. You got two votes there, so I'm sir. Yes, sir. All right. Um, so that's half of the six people that. Uh, uh, all right, go ahead, Mr. Glover. It's fine. Yeah, Miss Miss. Uh, Mike, it's fine. Oh, right. Thank you. Miss Walker gave a bit of history there. Uh, I remember when this thing was being discussing back then in 2005, those years about neighborhood overlay. And as she was stating that it had to do with the potential of what was being perceived as um, use the word for justification of moving in a high income homes into low income areas, like into West Dallas, uh, uptown and other areas of the city. Uh, so when, you, when Doug and others were speaking and you have alluded to the code uh, the uh, equity code uh, report, and I refer you from 2019 and Based on a scale of 100, uh, the neighborhood and infrastructure school thing was 47.42. But the language is, and, and this is something that many times is not uh, discussed, but it's very sensitive. And the language is here that there is a need for the city of Dallas to preserve historically 
African American, Hispanic American communities that have not had an opportunity to be able to have a revenue to have sustained themselves. In their and so these reports, this report that the city has, and I think uh, Mike, you can, uh, may want to address it, is saying that there must be some definite measures taken to preserve these communities. Um, I heard Doug mention a moment ago, and I made a note where about the lawful ownership and the new homeowners uh, versus uh, those of us who've been here. And we know that, as you stated, the number of new homes that are being built are the larger homes. Uh, over a period of time, uh, these homes are the, become this community. And eventually, particularly in an African-American community, there will be no uh, significant African-American communities like this in the Northern sector. We have, we have Hamilton Park, which was built uh, many years ago, but uh, Elm Thicken North Park is a unique community. So I just want to put that out there because this is what the city is and many other cities are beginning to look at in terms of equity. And that equity has to do with the historical uh, things that have been done in the past and that it does make individuals here in the present very uncomfortable uh, when we talk about how to reconcile and bring about that balance in terms of preservation of historical uh, African-American Hispanic communities. So, Mike, I just want to put that out there because at the heart of a lot of this is this particular issue that the city is dealing with. Yes, thank you, Mr. Glover. I wanted to throw that page up uh, where it talks about the score that Dallas has for neighborhoods within that equity indicators. And, and you know, uh, we're talking about long-term residential vacancies as, as one of the factors. Uh, if we scroll up a little bit, the cost of housing, the burden, um, because when your housing costs over 30% of your income, uh, it really creates a, a massive burden on your family. And so when we look at something like this, um, where we score 40 out of 100 um, overall for housing affordability in Dallas, it's 35 out of 100. But housing cost burden uh, between black and white, that disparity uh, can definitely be shown here. Um, we, it, this is uh, between 2016, 2019. Um, but that 32.89% cost burden. Uh, is is very high and and we're trying to address that we're trying to make that uh, that's part of the stabilization process is making the housing affordable and if it if it does involve you know going through and looking at taxes um, and that kind of thing we really need to uh, to work with those neighborhoods I think that's um, one of the surprising things that I ran across that um, just going back historically in Dallas, um, when it comes to home ownership, uh, the percentage of, of household black households that are owned by black families uh, is still around 27%. Um, it's actually gone down uh, to 24.56. Um, and that's about the same number that we had in 1960. Uh, in Dallas, so we're not making a positive change fast enough. So I, I do want to say that that's uh, something that uh, Mike, can I jump in and ask me multiple times in this process? Hey, hey, Mike, I just have a quick question. We've asked multiple times for the steering committee to address how these changes will help home ownership for our African American community and help the affordability for our seniors to stay in their homes and we keep talking about this over and over, but that has not been answered. Will these changes of restricting roof types, restricting lot coverage and height, will that increase home ownership for bl the blacks in our neighborhood? And will that increase affordability for blacks in our neighborhood?
Is there a member of the steering committee that wants to address that? Thank you, Jay. Mike, uh, this is Diane Johnson. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we out of all the meetings, we have been in a lot, and we're going over basically almost the same thing, um, without the um, the staffing changes that has been made. Uh, to me, we can have eleven, twenty-seven, forty-seven. 111 steering committee meetings. We had a crossroad. We really are. We're trying to keep what we're trying to do. It's not so much as um, affordability for um, black families moving in. We're trying to keep the integrity of the neighborhood that we live in. Uh, it's like the same question go over and over and over and over, and I've heard it all. We hear y'all. If y'all would have agreed to go down, use less yard, we wouldn't even be in all these meetings. This would be unnecessary. And it, it's, it's, it, it, it really bothers me. My health is not good. And this stresses me to the point that we're, why do we have to keep hammering the same information over and over at every meeting? All we're trying to do is keep it where we can sit in our backyard in privacy without y'all looking in our yard. That's not much to ask for. Think about the people that's living here. I'm not worried about nobody trying to move here. I welcome any new neighbor. I have whites, Hispanics, uh, Chinese, and Japanese in my family due to military men. I welcome you to the community. But think about your neighbors that's here already. Quit trying to bulldoze the people that live here. And and this is Gus Pettis. That's it, Mike. And, okay. And, and I'm gonna Mike. I'm gonna add on. This is Gus Pettis. I was uh, I'm on the steering committee for those that are on the phone that don't know me. Uh, I was also on the advisory council for the Neighborhood Plus. And somebody has got. I, maybe I need to back up from my computer so that you don't get the feedback. But uh, what I, I I listened to my late neighbors back in in 2016, 2016, 2017. We were going through the advisory uh, process. And yes, there was concern about taxes, but there was also a concern about quality of life uh, and what was happening to the neighborhood. And what we've seen really in the last five years since the since we you know, this process was we followed the process that the city gave us too. Uh, we worked very closely with uh, with Brian Price and the Dallas Planning Commission or P Dallas Planning Department on neighborhood sustainability. Uh, we said this is the best process that we could follow, and we followed it. We we did everything that the city asked us to do. But the biggest concern was, you know, what's the quality of life going to look like for the legacy homeowners here? Uh, and what we've seen really in the last five years, uh, really last two or three years, is that you get these monster, you know, uh, iPhone box houses that, you know, you have a 30 foot wall within five feet of the property line. And it uh, is not something you want to look at uh, from your from from your backyard, or from your cottage home or from your window. Uh, so we're looking to try to build houses or help the help houses that are built that look like houses uh, and that, you know, this is not a modern neighborhood. This is a traditional neighborhood. Uh, if you wanna build a modern house, you can still continue to do that and build a very large modern house under, under 20 feet from grade. Uh, I think that's reasonable. Everything we've asked for uh, from the uh, going back to neighborhood plus to the uh, steering committee is reasonable. We're not saying you can't build a two-story home. It's not saying that you can't build, you know, large, uh, you know, uh, rooms in your house if you want a high ceiling. What we're saying is, is that, you know, it's, it's really a quality of life. Now, again, a lot of the neighbors were say, saying that, yes, we want to make sure we can do something about property taxes. I think they realize that property taxes aren't going to go down. Uh, as a result, this is still a very desirable area. Uh, and I think property, property values are going to continue to go up no matter what happens 
uh, as a result of, of uh, a CPC and city council votes uh, that happened for this authorized hearing. But the, th the key is people wanna be able to feel like they're living in a neighborhood and feeling in a traditional neighborhood for the legacy homeowners. And you know, that's what I support. I had supported my neighbors when they said that. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna continue to do so. I think this is, this is what the crux of the issue is, is what, what area, what kind of look and feel and character of the neighborhood do we want? Do we want traditional, which is what the majority uh, of the legacy homeowners want, or I'd say the vast majority of legacy homeowners want, or do we wanna have a bunch of iPhone boxes in a dentist office that are in a rows down the street? People don't wanna, a lot of people don't wanna see that. Some people do, and that's their, that's their we're not trying to legislate taste uh, or beauty, we're just trying to say, what kind of neighborhood do we want to live in? And that was very clear back in 2015, 2016, into 2017, and what we're, what we're talking about uh, through this process. So I'm going to leave it at that, uh, but I'll be you know, quite, uh, quite happy to uh, answer any questions, too, about what I stated. Hey, hey, Gus, can you, just one question back to your neighborhood plus. How is the, how is the entire 1,500 homes that are affected by this solicited into that neighborhood plus conversation? Well, everyone was invited. Uh, Brian Price uh, sent out postcards. Please, no, no. How to How? property addresses or homeowners? Uh, to homeowners. I mean, I, he used or well, maybe and property. That is false. Maybe that was just. I know he used the Dallas Water Utility, so that was everybody in the neighborhood who was living here at the time. And that went to the home own the home the property addresses, not necessarily all the ownership. I, the I'm not 100 percent. And, and, I, and I, when you when you go down that road and you say the neighborhood plus, this is what the community wanted. And I heard that multiple times in the, over the last week. This is what the community wanted in, in 2016. And that is false because it wasn't pushed out in a manner that was inclusive to all the neighborhoods, Hispanic, white, landlords, uh, you know, anybody that just owned a, a vacant lot, they were excluded. All I know is that is that it was uh, it was done through the Dallas we Water. Through this, and we hey, figured out how. Are you gonna let me talk? Let me talk, because the thing is, it was sent out through the Dallas Water Utility, and Brian Price ran it. We were we followed the process that the city is. We had no say in how these notices were getting sent out, but they said we use Dallas Water Utilities. It is, it is the, the advisory committee's responsibility. If you're trying to make a change for an entire neighborhood, 1,500 homes, you should have been very concerned about how that process went, well, not you, just how. Well, I, you just the point is, I owned enough properties in that time frame. I never got one single notice. Okay. Not well, you don't know the process clearly. Uh, the process was the city sent out notices that we were forming this. We didn't even have an advisory count yet. So, so we had no say in how it was going to be done. The city neighborhood plus, it was done through the city. It was following the procedures that they had. If people weren't here or they, they were absentee landlords and didn't get the notices. And the, na the neighborhood that. plus program was never designed to institute something that circumvented an, a neighborhood stabilization overlay. It wasn't designed to go to the extent of rezoning an entire neighborhood. Never been done. So. All right. But you can, you so can I'm just them. saying, I guess the only thing I'm saying here is that the, the way this thing was originally presented and, and started was not inclusive of everybody in the neighborhood. Otherwise, there would have been an entirely different outcome because you would have had the opposition that you have now would have started at back at the very beginning other versus a very uh, non-transparent process that all of a sudden pops up in the six weeks of the steering committee that all of a sudden we're talking about changing roof heights and design standards and those kind of things. Okay. Well, that was brought up agree. back in we're 2016, we're but it had an entirely we're different. Gonna to, we're going to have to agree to disagree. And Okay, I'll drop okay. it for now because there's other questions. Yeah. Can I speak in? This is Ms. Walker. Hello? Yes, ma'am, go ahead. I want everyone, if you just have the time, go down Mockingbird and turn and go into Greenway Park. Drive down Livingston and Southern over in that section. It's the section when you take a left on Mockingbird and take the first right back into Greenway Park. Look at those new structures in that area. There are still traditional homes and new structures. 
but the new structures blend in with the existing ones. And they're still getting top dollar for both houses, for the new and the existing houses. That's what we're talking about. Houses that blend in with the existing houses. And that's a very good example if you would take the time and drive over to that section. There are houses that don't tower over the existing houses. And you still have the exact same footage inside that you want. And it's still over a million dollars. Those are, that's an, an, uh, an NSO and an HOA over there, Miss Patty. It's a well, conservation so we're talking district. about structure. We're still talking about structure. The new structures that are built. Look at how they're built. Mike, Mike King. Mike, yes, sir. This is Danny Rose. I'm on the steering committee. I have a question for you. Okay. How, how close are we um, in sending out letters to the community based on the consensus of the steering committee? based on what we have voted on. If, if in our next meeting, if the steering committee agrees to send forward their existing recommendations um, without uh, staff recommendations, then it will go on the next available CPC docket time slot. So uh, to give you an idea that it's, CBC meetings don't exactly happen uh, on, on a very fast schedule. The uh, the process of having a meeting is is kind of um, out there. Um, I don't know how to describe it more than that. It's um, it takes some time to get on the schedule. I'm trying to pull up the schedule here so I can share it. Um, Give me one second. Let me see if I've got it. Uh... Hey, Mike, this is you while you're doing that. Sorry to cut everybody off. Yeah. Just want to make sure right. I'm seeing in the community chat that difference between a NSO, a conservative district, or a conservation district, those are two separate type situations. Is that correct? Yes, those are two separate situations. Okay. Um, here's the zoning case schedule. Um, so these are very hard <laughs> deadlines that we have to meet. Um, make sure I was, un I was unmuted. Um, as it stands right now, uh, if I can get the steering committee to meet in the next 10 days, the earliest I can apply to get on the docket is 15 February, uh, which means if I move all the way down here, the actual CPC meeting would be 7 April. And if they move it straight through, it would make it to 25 May. So that's the very earliest uh, this case is going to go through the process. Uh, so I'm trying, I would. That's one of the, my goals in this meeting is to ask the, uh, the steering committee members that are here uh, to shoot me an email uh, tomorrow. And let's start talking about getting our next uh, steering committee meeting scheduled so we can work on these things. Uh, so just getting an idea here. This is not a, uh, a short process. Uh, if you're not a steering committee member and you're just learning about the process, um, that calendar is a good way to, to show you that there's opportunity for public input for both city plan commission and city council. So mm -hmm. uh, you'll, you'll, you'll find out when that's gonna be, I'm sure we're gonna, uh, we're gonna blast it via email, we're gonna blast it via uh, the public notice process, uh, city, uh, Planning Commission and, and uh, City Council requires mail outs as well to property owners. Uh, they don't go to addresses or whoever has a water meter. They go to uh, the property owner on record according to the Dallas Central Appraisal District. So, um, yeah, that's what we'll we'll tr get that notice out to you 
you have opportunities to participate in this process and have your voice heard. Mr. Johnson, uh, if I can get consensus of the steering committee, I, I, go ahead, sir. Or uh, Mr. Joyce, I'm sorry. Oh, sure. Thank you. I, I just had a quick question. Um, Mr. Perez said that um, housing affordability is not an issue here, and that's not one of the goals. I just want to understand and get confirmation from the steering committee that that's the case, because my understanding had been that that was one of the the goals here. So I just wanted to confirm that. And I'll jump in uh, since he's referring to what I stated. I, I didn't say that. Uh, I said that uh, people were concerned about quality of life as a primary driver. There was a concern about property taxes uh, going up. Um, and I do recognize, and I think everyone does recognize that we can't put a cap on property taxes or we don't have any control over that. Uh, but bottom line is, uh, I did not say that affordability was not an issue. I think the, 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 one of the things that was discussed was, you know, we do want to make sure that the homes remain affordable. Uh, that was discussed during the neighborhood plus and that, you know, people want to be able to say, Hey, we can, you know, workforce housing. I mean, that's a, that's a big issue right now with the city of Dallas. And we want to be able to, you know, make sure that that homes remain affordable for folks to move into, uh, into this neighborhood. Uh, so a lot of folks. How does that do that? How does this do that? How does this help homes remain affordable? Well, I, if, if, let's say, for example, uh, you know, someone wants to sell their house and they're selling it, you know, based on what the current value is, 450. That, that is affordable if you keep the cottage. You don't scrape it and build up uh, like what a developer would do. So maybe, you know, if families were saying, hey, I can move into this area, I'll pay a 450 for a house and a cottage and it's a nice little cottage, I'll move into that. That still keeps it affordable. But when you're having the pressure of developers who want to come in and, and make the most money per lot square footage, uh, that's the issue I think we're seeing. And 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 I hope that this this will address that. This will say this encourage more families to move into the neighborhood, uh, and uh, you know not have that pressure of having developers that are driving driving this process. So so we want more families. Is that another issue? Um, more families, I guess less. People without children, is that the goal? I never said that. I don't know you where you're getting more families. From. Well, for families, I mean, I'm referring to families generically. You know, people who want to start a family, you know, we're, we, we're talking about, you know, little cottages and maybe starter homes. This, these were original starter homes uh, for folks that were, you know, starting families, you know, little, you know, two ones and three twos uh, cottages. Um, it's so it, younger it's, people. I mean, I, I'm sorry, and I'm not trying to be difficult. But I really thought that affordability was an issue. And honestly, when you look at the, the forward Dallas plan, there are various ways to address affordability, such as vouchers, other things, um, public private partnerships, density requirements for uh, low income affordable housing within multifamily properties. This isn't one of them. So if we're trying to address for affordability, then we're not doing it. And, and if we're not trying to address affordability, I think we need to just acknowledge that. And I'll shut up. Well, I, I think we are addressing affordability with this. Um, and I will let, uh, you know, uh, other people speak on that. But I think, you know, again, but part of this is, again, you know, for me, it's the biggest issue is quality of life. Uh, and people don't, you know, and again, uh, if, if, if homes are being built that look like homes, I don't think we'd be here today, or at least having the same kind of discussion. Uh, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with, you know, large homes are okay. Uh, they just need to look like homes because of quality of life for a lot of the legacy owners. They're just, again, it's just, it's difficult to look out your window and see a 30 foot wall right next to you. Right. We live in one of those homes and we think our home looks like a home. So, yeah, um, thank you. yeah I'm, I'm referring to modern versus traditional. Mike, my, my, my question really quickly. Um, would you address if zoning in the city is responsible for legislating what is pretty and what is not? And will you also review the lifetime expectancy of homes that were built in the 20s, which many of these homes were? The other majority of the homes were built in the 50s and the 60s. Do you mind reviewing those lifetime expectancies as well? Okay. So, uh, 
I got hung up on the lifetime expectancy and I, I, I missed your first question. Um, I, I started thinking about it ahead of time. Sorry about that. Can you restate the first part? I'm not even sure I remember Mike. So just go with the second part of the question. Okay. So we're talking about uh, when you talk about lifespan of, of houses, um, the quality of building over the years, and I'm not, and this is very general because I'm not picking on anyone's particular builder, and I don't know the builders that were in the area. Uh, but generally, in the United States, houses built in the 1920s uh, have a lifespan of 120 plus years. Um, they they're built to last. The houses that were built in the 50s and 60s uh, to uh, were built with a little more speed and a little less. Uh, concern for quality just due to the baby boom and uh, the need for the, the explosive growth of, of single family housing within the United States and Texas. Uh, so housing built in the 50s and 60s does not have as great a lifespan. Um, I'm going to say 50, 60, uh, 80 years is the average lifespan of what was built there. Uh, unfortunately, some of the stuff built in the 70s was uh, it is showing its age more than the stuff built in the 20s and the 50s and the 60s. Um, so the, the housing stock, yeah, we have to look at the change of it. Uh, we also have to address, um, you know, what do you do with houses built in the 1920s? Uh, if it's got good bones, uh, it makes a lot more fiscal sense to, to fix it up than to scrape it in some cases. Uh, the damage is too extensive uh, and you have to take it down. And so there's a lot of things to weigh in there. Uh, I think which I think your first question uh, was about zoning. What can zoning do? Um, we don't we don't deal with the aging of, of the housing stock. Uh, that's more of a code compliance issue. Um, but yeah, I, we understand this is an area in transition. Effect taste. Uh, Mike, Mr. Glover, go ahead. Yes, comment and then a question. Uh, I heard Mr. Joy speaking, and I, uh, several questions have been raised about why the purpose of the zoning, even going back again several years ago when we were in the community discussing the Mac mansions, had, which had not arrived in our community yet, but there was a great deal of discussion, and it maybe have to do with more of the developers because as we look in our community, it is an experiment in design. Literally, uh, I, as I drive around looking at homes now, it seems as though developers are trying to create the most creative thing they can in terms of building uh, in our community, the types of homes they're building. Uh, the second thing is that what I did here at the community meetings was the whole issue of uh, invading on people's uh, property rights. And that's what I've heard a great deal of in terms of being able to build what, as I heard someone say, what they wanted, how they wanted, and then also how developers wanted to use the lot space to uh, maximize their profits. One of the things is that we know that if the city does not address the preservation and the continuation of affordable housing for African Americans and Hispanics, that this community will go the way of other communities. We should be, we, we, we just all need to be honest about this. This is what will happen to this area. As uh, I think Doug was saying, the new homeowners, yes. The new homeowners will basically buy out the community and it would not be uh, a place where people could come uh, who can afford the community. So my question, um, Mike, is this. Can the city do anything as anything to, to say to developers or work with developers say not every house being built in this community should be a two story uh mac mansion so that homes that be i'm not talking about track homes now please but i'm talking about homes that an average person can buy at a single story level versus a two story level within an affordable price so there's very little the city can do unless uh, they buy property and develop it with our housing department. Um, 
to, to do to build affordable housing. Uh, I know that there are some entrepreneurs in that neighborhood. I met a, a, a young lady in the neighborhood uh, that's that's buying and fixing up or buying and, and building new um, that are in the more affordable range. I, I know she's there and I, I appreciate and, and applaud the work she's doing. Uh, she's true. She truly understands um, what what they're trying to do and they, what the area plan address when it talks about stability and when it talks about uh, stabilization. Unfortunately, the zoning, there's very little we can do uh, to, to get it going. So I, I appreciate it, sir. I appreciate the question. It is. Uh, Mike, can can I respond to, to Clarence here just a little bit? Because I've, uh, I've, I think I have a, an insight that uh, I tried back in 2018 to build a uh, what ended up being a 2200 square foot single story uh, cottage style home. Uh, we called it a, uh, you know, it was a little inside, a little more uh, modern than the outside. Did exactly, I think, what uh, everybody would want to that is on the steering committee wants to have. We tried it. Uh, it didn't work in 2018. Uh, I actually still own the home because at the, the the end up there wasn't any buyers in 2018 for at anything that was going to make me a, a profit. And you, you're building these things for a profit. So uh, trying to do that, the market said no to that in, in 2018. It might be different now, but you know those are the kind of things that uh, you know. You have to factor in. You can't just say we wish this were the case. Uh, the market, from a builder standpoint, is going to dictate what they can build and what what sells. Uh, if you know the flat roof houses, I'm not a fan of those. But that's the market is saying that that's what the, you know the the buyers want. I don't know why, but that's that's it. And so it is a. Uh, I mean, Lou's built you know, dozens of the cottage homes and they've done really well, but it, it's a, it, you, you, the market dictates what this is, what's going to happen. What, when we're trying to go in and, and, and legislate what can and can't be done, it doesn't, it, it isn't, it isn't doing it based on any, any factual data. It's, it's about what we, what somebody, what somebody's taste is, what uh, it doesn't have any factors. We, we haven't, and the steering committee hasn't done any kind of research as to what sells, uh, what doesn't, you know, any kind of uh, even trying to look at a compromise. What, you know, bringing, you know, half a dozen builders together and saying, you know, what would be a good approach to this? None of that's ever happened. It's just been this, a process that has said, this is what we want. And, and basically, every time I put something up there, I get I get shot down because I'm labeled as the builder, and 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 whatever I might want, it's got to, got to be bad. Uh, so, you know, we we've gone down and we got very divisive on this. Nobody's ever sat down, and I guess I can put myself in that same category as to try and reach out and say, you know, let's have a real conversation about what some of these houses look like. What's, you know, is it is it really a height issue or is it, you know, is it really the flat roof issue? What, you know, we, we threw everything in there and, and you were, and with the expectation that the whole neighborhood is going to go along with it. Hey, Mike, hey, Doug. Yeah, I'm, I'm going on. I'm sorry. Yeah, Doug, Doug. This, this is Danny Rose. Uh, you made a good point. Mr. Lirio, uh, the builder, uh, in the neighborhood, he has, you know, over 70 to 100 houses in the neighborhood. He meets all these standards to what we are trying to put in place. The hook and gable roofs, most of his houses are selling each and every time he places them on the market. So uh, uh, this is one builder that is qualifying his house to meet these standards. Agree, but some of these are going to, but the, but some of these restrictions are going to impact what the the height limitation what he can build so if you're happy with lose houses 
you would say, yeah. well, maybe we would legislate the taste, but let's not legislate the But heights. most of his houses have the look and feel of the neighborhood based on what, what he's putting up. Hi, 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 hi. Um, Lou Alario was on here earlier. I think he had to jump off. He's adamantly opposed to all of these because many of his homes that he has built, which I think that you're insinuating that you like, would not meet these criteria, to be honest. Well, we, and, based and based so on he, what we see and based well, on what he's selling. Yeah, you know, and so yeah, that kind of goes back to Mike to put in give place. Visual. I think this actually that would go back to the city to give visuals because there is a lot of misconceptions about what would be accepted. Mike, I think this point we need to move on to the voting for the, okay. for the neighborhood to make a vote. Yeah. This is Miss Walker. Can I? Can you all hear me? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Can I say something? Go ahead. Um, yes. This is what I want to go on the back of, of Reverend Glover, Reverend Glover, what he said. The whole thing that we're talking about here, well, I can't speak for everybody, but I'm speaking for myself, is the fact of every time there's a development, black people and uh, Hispanic people are left out. Now, I'm going to tell air some dirty laundry about the city of Dallas. It was several years ago, there were some developers that came to town and they said that they wanted to build some high rise downtown, some lofts in downtown Dallas. They had a number that was set aside for affordable housing where they could get middle income people to move in as well as higher income people to live into the same complex. It was a good mix of people and it was through a HUD development. The city of Dallas turned their plans down, but they took that HUD money and gave it to the developers and they put in high-end apartment complexes down, lost downtown. They left out the middle-income people. Well, they thought that the other people, first people, they were going to just walk away and not find out about it. But some way they got wind of what they did and they came back and they sued the city of Dallas. And Dallas had to come back up with that money and pay HUD back, but the damage was already done. No middle income people could move into those complexes downtown, even though the HUD money was used. Now affordability, out next to where the old Galleria was at, there was another set of apartments out there that was HUD. It burned down. The city council said that they wanted to build another complex out there, but they didn't want middle income or low income people there. They wanted high end. HUD came back and told them it, it burned down with HUD money. You have to build another HUD. It's not built. That's what we're talking about. Thank you, Ms. Patty. Quick, I want to, uh, real quickly, that's uh, a question. Mr. Holman. Uh, we've had reference to Mr. Alirio speaking, and he's finally uh, able to speak. I'd, I'd like to give him an opportunity to address uh, everybody. So, Mr. Alirio. Thanks, Mr. Thank you, Thank you Mr. King. Um, Mr. Glover, I appreciate your uh, sentiment regarding the homes I've built over the past 15 years uh, in, in the Elm Thicket, but Mr. Brower is correct that pretty much everything I've built, I would not be able to build under these uh, down zone uh, changes. I would be over the height and uh, lot uh, restrictions. It was uh, Danny, Danny who mentioned that uh, regarding your home, sir. It was, it was Danny Rose. Oh, oh, oh sorry. sorry. Yes, but may, 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 I, may I ask a question, sir? How, I'd like to ask a question here. Can anyone tell me roughly how many developers are in our community, roughly, who, who live here uh, in, our, in our community? Do you have a rough idea? Does anyone know? Doug? Doug, 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 Doug. I, I don't know that I can answer that question. I know several that actually live in the neighborhood that are building. Uh, okay, I so, personally know probably six different builders. Okay, no develop. Okay, developers versus builders. Yeah, we don't have developers here in the neighborhood. We have builders. 
Uh, okay. Developers. How many builders in on? How many builders in the community now? Well, I, don't, I couldn't well, speak to all of them. I could, I mean, I can go. I can, I can think of at least six, six, six that I've six, met and in, in, that I know. Because I'm, I'm raising this question because would it be uh, in that the city can? We are neighbors, and we're speaking. And I'm speaking as a neighbor. Can neighbors come together? And those of you who are builders, that we can have the type of conversation to discuss. What type of homes can be built that will meet a builder's uh, requirement to make a profit, as you just stated, uh, sir? Because this is what it's all about. And somehow come to some balance so that, uh, again, I'm not a builder, <laughs> I'm not a developer. You're speaking but, my language, Clarence. So, <laughs> but, but, but can, because what we're talking about here tonight is. Uh, either we're going to say we're going to preserve culturally uh, uh, communities, African Americans, and, 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 and hear me out. <laughs> Those who always say this is a close race, the African American and Hispanic, but particularly I'm an African American, the communities that have not been able to survive in this city, in this country, have never had the foundation on which to build. Let me give you a, the, my family is from Memphis, Tennessee. That was the first African American community where African Americans could build homes in Orange Mound. The first, my grandmother lives at an address. Okay. That's what I'm talking about. They, and they're going through a similar thing around how to preserve Orange Mound as an African American community and the housing. Elm Thick and North Park has a significant history. Some call it Freeman, some call it the black community, some call it safe community, whatever. Uh, there's a mixture of things going on here. But my concern is, can we sit down and begin to discuss beyond the types of sizes of houses that you all are building, other homes that can be new homes along with the bungalows we have and you still make a profit? Answer to that, and for me personally, is absolutely yes. I would. I mean, I think that would, we would welcome a a legitimately objective conversation, where you know that those kind of things can be discussed. I I think that um, over last week and and Monday when I was out there meeting with the neighbors, uh, Mr. Glover, Mr. Brower. Uh, Ms. Chambers, Ms. Johnson, uh, Ms. Walker, I, the steering committee, I, I, I had a lot of people come through and say, well, the steering committee doesn't listen to the neighborhood. And I'm sitting there going, well, Mr. Rose came out, uh, you know, every, every, almost every member of the steering committee was out there at one point or another, and they were listening to people and they were talking to people. And I, and I think we had some good conversations between builders, um, and new homeowners and longtime homeowners, I think that those conversations are going to lead to uh, hopefully healing what has caused so much division, which is, I think there's a misunderstanding of what the goals are uh, of this process and how this process is working. Uh, I, I really would like to uh, to tell you, I'm, I've got this list of, of everybody's, all the questions in the chat, and everything that's come up, we're going to come up with a Q and A, and we're going to put it out, and and with answers that are well thought out, and try to get everybody's uh, questions addressed. Uh, we're just running really short on time right now. Um, I, I I was like, man, I'm going to schedule this for two hours. I think we might be able to accomplish everything. Um, it, it's not going to happen. Uh, I wish it would. I'm I'm going to. Uh, Put my slideshow back up real quick um, and give everybody an opportunity to um, get my contact information and make sure that we all um, we all can be on board with this and, and see uh, let's see. Why are, you, why are you doing it? Can you hear me? This is Jonathan Maples. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, you were you there. Know, you know, all you know through, through through all of this, it's a tough situation. And I want to say thank you to you and your team for doing or trying to do your due diligence. 
You know, it started with Nathan. Well, actually, it started before Nathan. It started several years ago. Um, and we appreciate you coming out um, the three days last week to be heard so that you can hear from the community. We appreciate this today. Um, take a look at all the data you've collected. And um, let's move this forward. I think that was a question that, that Danny asked. This is this has been hanging around for a long time, man. And I know that there are other zoning cases right behind this one. And unfortunately, Dallas just doesn't have a plan. And because of that, this is this is the outcome of it. But again, thank you, and we support you in what you do. So, Jonathan, you. you are not in favor of of gathering a a, a small group of built of builders slash community. I'm members. sorry. Why does Jonathan have a say if he's in favor or anything or not? He's not on the steering committee. Well, others have I mean, been there. Neither, 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 he's on neither, the steering neither, committee, but he is not on it. Neither is Lou Olario. I just I just chimed in to thank Michael. What what's the problem with thanking him? We're, we're Jonathan. We're okay. We're, we're okay with you being on. I just wanted to ask you a question. Your your yeah. uh, My, influence in the neighborhood. Are you? Hey, Doug. I'm, I'm sorry, Doug. Doug. I'm not. I'm sorry, Doug. I'm not taking any questions. I just wanted to thank Michael and the team downtown for what they're doing. It's a tough process, and I just wanted to thank them. That's it. That's all. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And I, I it is my pleasure to work with this neighborhood. I. Uh, I really want to do what's best for it. Uh, somebody asked if, uh, how does staff that has with no dog in the hunt? Uh, can we treat this neighborhood fair? Uh, one, ethically, you don't want somebody that owns property in a neighborhood to make decisions about the property. There's there's some ethical issues there. Um, but the, but the big thing is I'm a resident of Dallas. I love Texas. I love North Texas. I love Dallas. Uh, my wife and I have lived here for 20 years, and we ab my my goal is absolutely to do what's best for this city and to do what's best for this neighborhood. Uh, so I'm listening, and we're going to try to right this ship, and we're going to try to heal this neighborhood when this is all said and done. Uh, I want you, uh, if you're online and you can see it, uh, my contact information is there, my phone number. If you've got a pen and paper handy and you're on the phone, my phone number is 214-670-6131. And my email address is Michael, that's M-I-C-H-A-E-L dot King, that's spelled K-I-N-G, at Dallas City Hall, all one word, dot com. And, and just so... I want to make sure everybody can reach out to me. I, I understand some people don't have internet access and they're calling on the phone. So remember, I, I can be reached by phone and email. 214-670-6131. Um, I, I want to speak specifically with uh, the steering committee that's online right now since we're running up against 8 o'clock. Um, if in the next day or so, uh, hopefully tomorrow, I'll send out an email, let you guys uh, pick some dates. Uh, I want to pick something soon, uh, but give everybody enough notice for the meeting that's going to happen, uh, and we'll talk some more. Um, let's let's continue to trade ideas uh, on our recommendations and where we can find some middle ground and some agreement. Uh, so with that, um, I also want to remind or let everybody know, uh, Commissioner Hampton, uh, your city plan commissioner is on this call. She's been listening. She's been listening to all, quite a bit of them. And uh, and so uh, please be aware, you know, she's there. She knows how the neighborhood is responding to this. She sees the comments. She she asks the questions and she wants this to go to city plan commission so that they can ask the questions. Um, it, Commissioner Hampton, would you like an opportunity to speak or am I putting you on the spot? Okay, I may have just put her on the spot there. So. Uh, excuse me, Mike. Mike, Mike. Mr. Glover, go ahead. One last question, uh, Doug. 
I like to ask a question as a commitment. Doug, I would like to ask if we, you and I, whoever, can we have a meeting of the developers and the builders in the community? I like to, I, I would like to come. I like if no one else, I'd like to know who you are and uh, and maybe to meet and, and ask questions regarding the whole issue of building houses and homes in this area and how that might meet. Please, please call and, me, Claire. And, uh, my number. <laughs> okay, align itself with maintaining the African American affordability in this community. What's the number? Oh, I can't see that. Two one four. Okay. Two zero seven. Zero seven. Seven zero. Two zero seven six two. Seven zero. All right. All right. Thank you. Mr. King, can I ask a quick question? The contact information for the steering committee for the ones who volunteer their contacts, since they are supposed to represent all of us. Um, those contact information was taken down very recently. So none of us have any sort of way of getting a hold of anybody on the steering committee. Can you explain why that happened? I don't know why it happened. We had a changeover in um, uh, when our department changed over. Uh, I don't know if it was a policy change or if it was just a website uh, change that it slipped through. Uh, if if the steering committee is put has I've got a list of uh, publicly available phone numbers and email addresses for them. Uh, I'll put it back online. And so yeah, that's going to be a priority this week is getting all of this information back online. Uh, I even want to have links to some of the uh, comprehensive planning documents on this on this same website uh, so everybody can see uh, what's out there. Um, with that, I think we're about going to wrap it up. I appreciate everybody's time. Uh, Mr. Glover, Mr. Brower, I look forward to y'all meeting. I, I know you guys are uh, very concerned for the neighborhood. You really love each, the, the people in the neighborhood. I've seen that in, uh, in the last meetings I've been in. Um, uh, Commissioner Hampton uh, is unavailable to talk. She can't get her microphone to work. Um, so I, I do want to say that she, she would be talking if she could, uh, she wants to thank everyone for being there tonight. And it was a good discussion. Uh, with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Um, and I will, uh, look forward to seeing and hearing from everybody soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. Be safe. Thank you. Mike. Looking forward to it. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Thanks Mike. Thank you, 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 Mike.